Welcome to the Sports Pro Podcast. Hi everyone and welcome once again to the Sports Pro Podcast. My name is Owen Connolly. I'm the editor-at-large at Sports Pro. Hope you're well. Uh, very pleased to be back and very pleased to welcome back from the Athletic Football News reporter, Matt Slater. Hello, Matt. Hey, Owen. You right? I'm not too bad, Matt. How are you? Yeah, good. We are going to be continuing our uh, look at the European Championship. Euro 2020 is off and underway across Europe, and we're going to be gathering some early impressions and uh, just diving into a few of the big stories uh, that have defined week one across the continent. A little bit later on, we're going to be hearing as well from TJ Isofano, who's the head of growth and strategy consulting at Infront X about the evolution of digital fan experiences. That's coming up in part two. Uh, but part one, Matt, we've we've been trailing it in the last couple of weeks. It's the it's the big story in town, of course. It is UEFA Euro 2020. Bit to get through in the back end. Obviously, the tournament is evolving a little bit faster than our publishing is because this is going to be coming out on Thursday. Uh, when the first round of fixtures is is done, and there might be stories that we haven't been able to anticipate, of course, big tournaments being what they are. But what have uh, what have some of your opening impressions been? Well, the sun's out; that always helps. Um, you know, England made a England made a bright start, so obviously that's a slightly biased pro cure view on things. But it's 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 nice to nice to finally win an opening game in a European Championship, um, and. Um, I don't think we need to say go to go too much further than that. Really, it was a from from what I saw, it was a perfectly perfectly decent performance against an okay side. I was really impressed with Italy. Uh, I watched all of that game. I uh, wondered if they were kind of sort of coming in under the radar. Um, you know, having not had the best of times in 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 sort of more recent seasons, but but actually on a really good run at the moment on this fantastic sort of. Uh, run, you know, built in that kind of t- almost a typical Italian way, you know, very sound at the back, but with with a you know surprising amount of flair and you know really sort of skillful players that that I haven't seen a huge amount of. I, mean, I was obviously aware of them, but I thought they they were really good. Yeah, they've caught my eye. Uh, the Netherlands game was fun, wasn't it? You know, end to end, that kind of had a, you know, sort of knockabout sort of feel to it. I like that game. Um, Scotland was disappointing. You know the result, but you know everyone's got quite excited about that. Yeah, I mean, it's all it's been it's been fine, hasn't it? I mean, I'm trying to think who else has impressed me. Um, you know, Spain, Spain, you know, knocks it around really well. We couldn't put it in the couldn't put it in the net. I'm looking forward to so we're recording on um, Tuesday. I was going to say, yeah, we're recording on, we're recording just before the really big favourites show up. France, of course, who are probably ahead above everybody else. Um, I mean, it's funny that you talk about the parochial your parochial reaction to it, watching England and thinking about England first. The thing that we're still trying to get our heads around is this pan-continental model and how that's going how that, how that's going to characterize the tournament over the next uh, the next four weeks. And you know, in, in a future podcast, we will look at this impact on on host cities in a little more depth, but. It is different from what we expected. And obviously the tournament is very, very different in lots of other ways with the pandemic and uh, the limits on international travel and the limits on capacities. But it means it's probably going to take a lo- little bit longer for the tournament to find its centre, I guess. You're right. I mean, if you think about most summer tournaments, you know, they're based in, in, in well, they're in one country um, and you get that wonderful sense of the world, a world, a continent um, coming together. You know, the travelling fans sort of certainly tend to make it for me, certainly at the beginning, before the kind of, you know, the really sort of the football takes over, the kind of strong narratives of the tournament start to emerge. Um, You know, that was absolutely obvious in Russia where the sort of story for the first few days really was that kind of, you know, there the sun was out, Russia was putting its best face to the world and was being incredibly hospitable. Fans came from far and wide and, um, and really enjoyed themselves. This is a different tournament, but even if it was, I think, in just one place, um, you know, I, I have very fond memories of Euro '96. I was just finishing at university, and I went to quite a couple of those games, and I just, I just, you know, that was a great tournament. Again, yeah, well, again, we, we we don't know yet, but England sort of contributed to that tournament in terms of you know the football side of things. 
um, you know, we shall see if if it goes um, like that this time around. But you know, that, that was a sort of very sort of traditional sort of feel to a tournament. You know, visiting fans, um, venues scattered around the country. But yes, yeah, so you have a sort of sense of the country coming together. Everybody in the country being having a stake in the tournaments as well. Um, you know, I've been I've been as a fan, but I've also been you know as a as a journalist to, to overseas tournaments. France '98 was good. I was there as a as a fan. Um, uh, Germany 2006 was brilliant. Probably the, probably the best I've ever been to. Um, largely because I stayed completely away from England games and went to random games and just had a wonderful time. Uh, yeah, those two spring to mind. Um, I don't think, I'm sure there's a Euros in there as well somewhere. But yeah, I was younger then and, um, and perhaps not concentrating so much on the football. But um, yeah, it's a very different tournament and coming at the end of a very different time, you know, different season, but just a different time in the world, in the world's experience. You know, we're all coming off the back. We're still in it, you know. So here we are in a tournament. We were really hoping this tournament could be the beginning of normality again. It, you know, it, it's close. It's tantalizingly close, but it's not quite there, is it? And the, you know, the headlines of the last few days have been, have, have just reminded us of just how strange things have been for 15, 16 months, and 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 could be for quite some time to come. So, um, it's a totally different tournament. That right from the outset, this tournament was going to be strange. It was supposed to be a, you know, a, an unusual celebration of its 60th birthday. And Michelle Platini's idea, he wanted to share it around Europe. There's there's there are different versions of, of where the idea came from. One one pretty good theory is there'd been actually minimal interest in in a you know more traditional host. Um, you, you know Turkey had been had been sort of sniffing around for one for a while and continues to do so, but but decided quite late to to, to prioritise an Olympic bid. That kind of left you away for a little bit in the lurch. You know Germany was already thinking a little bit later, twenty four, and they went with this. Um, and tried to sort of sell it really as a positive, you know, who knows. And for quite some time pre-COVID, you know, if we would never say this publicly, but certainly privately, it was a headache. You know, they often used to sort of, you often used to sort of hear about the logistical challenges. Maybe that was, you know, journalists asking about the logistical challenges, but it was pretty clear that this was going to be tricky. And quite late in the process, they almost then tried to create a centre to it by making sure that that London hosted the semi-finals and the final. And again, there was an element of of that came off the back of this situation with Turkey about things that they'd been promised and you know then had handed back. So they kind of cre- it whilst it was spread across Europe, it was going to finish in one place. There was going to be a sort of final four element to it. It's funny because we're talking about final four elements, aren't we now for for all UEFA competitions, club competitions as well. And that was going to sort of provide a more traditional end to this tournament. And then, of course, COVID comes along, throws it all up in the air again. And actually, in recent weeks and months, UEFA have been trying to sell, certainly this, you know, when they sort of talk about this format, as almost a positive. It's you've created, well, 12, then it was 11 biosecure bubbles, and you've limited travel. Nine of these teams were effectively at home. And once the away fan was taken out of the equation, for really obvious reasons, then you know, the kind of multi-centre, the multi, you know, city host format doesn't seem so odd at all and actually kind of makes some sense and has, has, has possibly helped. I mean, we shall see, won't we? I mean, I think, you know, once they've made this decision however many years ago, they were stuck with it. As it turns out, because of COVID, it's perhaps not as dreadful an idea as it as, as it was looking like a few years ago when they when they did genuinely sort of seem to be like oh god it's just so many headaches imagine trying to do it in one place you've got to do it in a dozen places and how do we how do we create create that sense of of of, net, of party where where is the party at so anyway that's that's what we've left with yeah and i think over the course of the tournament as i mean wembley is hosting a game in every round so i think wembley will gradually emerge as, as the spine uh, of the competition but yeah, that it is going to be an interesting phenomenon to observe, and we'll come back to some of the the organisational aspects a little bit later on in the in the chat. But you know, the big story of the opening weekend, and one that could have had a cast a very very dark shadow over the competition, of course, was the fate of uh, of Christian Eriksen, who collapsed with a suspected heart attack uh, during Denmark's opening game against Finland, um, and. 
you know, of course, as the week has progressed, his health has, has improved and he's been uh, he's been sharing some images on, on social media as we're speaking this morning. And, you know, you have to, of course, give enormous credit to everybody who acted so quickly in, in that situation. It's really shocking, harrowing scenario to be involved in. But, of course, the medical professionals who are on standby did a fantastic job. Uh, Simon Kier as well was credited as, as having been first on the scene and uh, and made some very critical interventions to make their job a bit easier. What people are increasingly talking about, though, now is what happened after that. First of all, with the coverage, which we'll come to in just a sec, but also with, you know, once it was clear that Ericsson was stable and he was fine, or as fine as could be expected in, in those circumstances, the players were presented with a choice about how they wanted to proceed and whether they wanted to finish the game that day or the next day, which feels like not much of a choice, to be honest. And, you know, you do wonder how much how much consideration was, was given to could we just shake hands and, and take a point each, how much consideration, how much leeway there was in the rules. And it does feel like this is a conversation that's going to, come back at the end of the tournament that FIFA Pro will have its say and, and some of the other players' organisations will have their say, particularly given the length of the season that we've just come off. Uh, some of the personal sacrifices that, that athletes, not just in football, but in other sports have made and the expectations that there might be if calendars continue to to fill out and, and more tournaments are added to, to schedules. No, I completely agree. I mean, with, with all of that, really. Um, yeah, I mean, look, um, ever since the pause that um, took place when COVID first struck Europe, um, but of course it already halted football elsewhere, the football, make, football organisers, the rule makers have been making allowances and concessions to try and meet contractual obligations, be they to broadcast the sponsors, ticket holders, you name it. They tried to desperately to keep the show on the road. And and it can be quite easy at times to sort of always immediately then go, oh, it's all about money. Yeah, of course it's all about money. But, but you know, there is, a, there is a reason that they try to do all of those things. And that is to sort of keep, to sustain the industry. Um, you know, and if you think about some of the worst predictions of what might happen to clubs down the pyramid, um, they've largely been avoided so far. So the the desire on the part of, if you like, big football, the, the people that make the decisions to to carry on, is, is is understandable and I think can be justified. However, right, in the same spirit that they've made concessions about extra subs, be it water breaks, wasn't it at the at the tail end of last season? Um, they've expanded the squads. There were special rules that came in. In May for this tournament, so we went from 23 to 26 with the five subs. So, and you know, a bigger bench. So, with that spirit of we are in unusual times, and we have asked you as players to go longer, further than you normally would without a good break. So, some of the numbers that were coming into this tournament um, of the number of games that some of the leading players at leading clubs that had gone deep into Europe last season had gone had big European campaigns this year. 80 plus, 80, you know, I think Bruno Fernandes was, was almost 90 games, wasn't he? It was ridiculous, you know, for club and country. So there were, there were, you know, a lot of players that have played a lot of football. And we also know that it never stops, right? Because we have Qatar on the, on the horizon. So we already have crazy, con you know, concentrated amounts. This is a really unusual time, I think, in professional football. And it, it, it cannot continue like this. The calendar is one of the looming issues that, constantly keeps getting shunted you know further kick you know can kick further down the road so there's some you know that fifa uefa all the confederations input from the leagues hopefully and fifa bro are, are properly going to have to grab the ball by the horns at some point i i, I worry that they won't they'll it, just fudge around the edges and just just hope that we'll just sort of you know keep stumbling forward and ultimately the players will just be tired or we're just gonna have to get used to them you know being injured or resting and you know, and we'll, we'll see what sort of impact that has on viewing figures and, um, you know, how we feel about the game. All of that said, that's all happening. That was all happening anyway. So that's that's almost separate to what happened with Christian Eriksson. I, I personally don't really want to get too much into speculation around him because we've had these terrible 
yeah, we've had these terrible accidents and tragedies before. Um, we I don't know enough. I've not seen enough, heard, read, read enough um, to know exactly what happened, why it happened. We may never know, right? How much did we really know about, um, you know, Mark Vivian Foley or um, Fabrice Mwamba? These, these, these terrible things happen, you know, just in Edinburgh. There are so many others. In, and, and, and in the past, there has been, I think, positive reactions from the game to try and try and um, take some of the risk out if you can. So, you know, the medical provision at games is much better than it was. Defibrillators um, are much more available than they were. There's one of my kids' amateur football team. There's one, as I'm giving this interview, I'm looking out the window across the road at the bus stop. There's one at the bus stop. So, you know, that's that's something that in our lifetimes, I mean, you know, I, you know I've been CPR trained as a, as a, as a youth football coach. I, I'm not sure my coach, when I was a kid, was... CPR and defibrillator trained. I mean, I'm almost certain they weren't. So, so I think we've almost got to sort of sometimes step back and sort of think about the kind of really general things that were an issue coming into the tournament about player fatigue, workload, but also just um, just just a, a ludicrously congested calendar. You know, the whole concept of you know uh, scarcity value just appears to have gone out the window. Competing interests, um, just allowing some room and space for the players to breathe, for the product to breathe. Um, all, all absolutely necessary, and then the very sort of specific stuff around Christian Eriksen. Well, we need to know more. We need to know what if there was a link, if there was an impact. We, we just don't know. So let's let's not sort of go spend too much time on that now. Let's continue to try and make the game as safe as possible. I think the reaction of the players and the fans there was absolutely spot on and impeccable, and just you know fills me with faith in human goodness again. I have genuine concerns and issues about the choice the players were presented afterwards and again I think we are you're right gonna gonna learn more about that and why they were given that Hobson's choice and could there have been a longer postponement could really that decision should have been taken out of their hands yeah really they should they should they should not really be given a choice they should have been told we'll come back in 48 72 hours guys don't worry about it you know, let's let's get let's get better news from Christian, and let's all do this game when we're ready to play. Or, as you say, maybe it was a draw. I, you know, what I suspect the players would have wanted to have settled that, but not not in an hour and a half's time while they're still not sure about what's happened to their friend. And at the time they made that decision, could any of them really have thought, well, Tomorrow at noon is not going to be much better. How much how, how much more confidence I am I going to be have that Christian Eriksen is going to pull through by tomorrow? So it was it was a it was um it was a horrible situation for them to be in, and we'll never know, right? But you know Denmark were on top; they were the favourites going into that game, and they lost. So so you know you can I think I think you can speculate a little bit there about the impact that had on that game. Although of course. We are assuming that it had no impact on the Finns. And of course, it did have an impact on the Finns. It had an impact on everybody. It, it, it would have changed the entire mood around that game. So, yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a lot there. There's stuff that we absolutely need to deal with, the game needs to deal with, that it didn't need that really to happen for it to have to deal with them. Those issues about the calendar and congestion and workload a thief bro i've been talking about this for a while so have the pfa so have player unions around the, around so if you, you know speak to players they'll tell you yeah and i think it, it is important to acknowledge as you say in the wake of what happened to fabrice Mwamba, who got lucky in a different way because there was a consultant cardiologist in the ground who the stewards let onto the pitch to, to direct his um his uh resuscitation but they did in, ensure that there would be defibrillators at every game that you know that the, the People had adequate training to deal with these kind of uh, these kind of collapses. Um, I'll point people to specialist charities. Cardiac risk in the young is one that I'm aware of because my brother ran a marathon for them when he was uh, in his early twenties. Someone in, uh, he was at university with collapsed at 19 on a run and, and and died of a heart attack. It can happen, and it is important to extrapolate. Sorry, to separate that from the workload because I'm not suggesting that, that that those two things are linked, but it's more the, the political side of it, I guess, in the aftermath and what there was a, a bit of a, an echo of that was slightly unpleasant. And you alluded to Mark Vivian Fowey there 
um, dying in a, in a Cameroon international. That, of course, that was a FIFA Confederations Cup game. And Cameroon were then asked to play the final and did. And, you know, you do wonder how much sensitivity has been learned in the, where are we, 18 years since then? And, and what, you know, how how well the authorities would have reacted had, had the worst happened. And I think that these are, are some important uh, important considerations to make. I wanted to get your perspective because another thing that people talked about, and this was a really difficult situation, you know, you're not a broadcaster, but you are a journalist and you uh, you you have experience of following a live story and having to make very, very quick judgments. You know, there's been a lot of discussion about the way the incident was covered in real time and the balance between trying to get some information, not really being sure what was going on, particularly, I suppose, from, from the director's booth um, and not being intrusive and not being kind of, uh, you know, ghoulish and, and playing up the, 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 the human soap opera angle of it, which I think people felt as it as the situation progressed, you know, there was a sense of a line being crossed, perhaps. I mean, what did you make of that? What, what, what how do you feel the, the host broadcaster reacted to that scenario? Well, um, so I should probably declare you know, a slight conflict. I used to work for the BBC and, you know, I, I have, you know, I was, you know, used to do sort of broadcasting for them. So it, it's, look, it's very tricky. I also wasn't watching live. I was listening in the car, actually driving back when it happened. And I thought, I thought the radio coverage on, on five live was, was absolutely brilliant. I mean, they, they are, those guys are unbelievably experienced broadcasters that have, that have unfortunately seen a lot of and, and commented on a lot of bad stuff and, and just, just, just handled it really, really well. By the time I got in, I went to turn the television on and I'd, I'd sort of was already kind of fiddling with my phone a little bit. So I was aware of some of this, this unease about what the TV cameras were showing. But by the time I got in, the BBC uh, coverage had, had gone and was showing a gardening program, I think. So, um, you know, I, I didn't witness any of it myself the tv coverage like i said i thought the radio coverage was spot on very respectful didn't speculate just stuck to facts um an absolute you know nightmare for a for a box there because you know you you have dead air you know so you, you have this, this you know this need to sort of desire to sort of go get a fresh voice and the fresh voices can't really say a great deal um and, and you know that's compounded on tv you know because you because you have that plus the pictures now obviously i've read all the coverage, and I, you know, looked through the social media commentary on what was happening. Um, look, my my personal take, and like I said, I didn't watch it live in the moment. Is I think sometimes there can be a little bit of a pile on the BBC, particularly at the moment. Well, actually, for, for quite some time, and I would be very careful about um, assuming that a lively reaction on Twitter is indicative of much to be honest because if it was um i wouldn't have been on the wrong side of about the last five or six elections you know twitter twitter isn't 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 life um i think some people are very quick to be annoyed with the bbc for whatever reason and that's it really um i i understand that the picking out of of, of christian erickson's partner was 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 part of the complaint and that 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 is insensitive particularly if it was prolonged and if it was repeated but that appeared to be from what i've read and i've also you know heard some commentary about it as well I've heard some podcasts about it i you know i think if there's something happening people had an enormous amount of interest in it. i know you know public interest is not a defense for ghoulish behavior you know certainly a, you know a, a a mature and responsible broadcaster has to rise above that, you know, just because people are interested in it does not mean it is of public interest, but um, equally it was a live event, happened very fast. Um, I have not seen any, you know, evidence of anything that I thought was massively intrusive apart from, I think perhaps, you know, a, a repeated look at Mrs. Erickson um, was probably you know, regrettable. And I, I'm sure people would, would, if they could do it again, would, would not have done that. Yeah. And again, perhaps that's an area where people will learn and, and happily 
this is a scenario where where Christian Eriksen does appear to be on the mend, and it can be learned from a situation that ultimately ended up um, as positively as positively as it could have done. Um, but whether there's some kind of protocol that's established, or because you could see the situation that was developing was you, yeah, you, you're trying to find the best way of delivering information, and in that position, it was with the camera. Um, but there was a point at which that no longer became appropriate. But what was also apparent was that television companies that had spent 40 minutes preparing highlights packages for the following 15 minutes um, were in no position to cover the story either. And it was, you know, I think that perhaps will be will be the lesson that's taken is, is what you do, you know, in the same way that a very well-drilled news organisation will be ready for uh for for cataclysmic events you know is there a way of preparing sports led um operations for that but there we go um the tournament goes on and and yeah everybody's best wishes are, are with Christian Eriksen and uh in in his recovery which hopefully will happen sooner uh, and speedier rather than later a couple of things to just take us into the close this is a story which hopefully, although we don't know because England are playing Scotland at Wembley on Friday, but hopefully is is one that is going to fade, at least in terms of its contentiousness. But England players have been taking the knee throughout the build-up to Euro 2020 and did again uh, on Sunday in, uh, in an anti-racist gesture. Um, briefly, we've seen it through European leagues all, all season and we've seen a, a couple of other teams or a few other teams at the finals do it. The thing that strike I mean, we're not going to get into the ins and outs of it, and I, I think you and I will be on the, the same side of this particular uh, debate, such as it is, about whether it's a nice, you know, whether it's an appropriate thing for uh, a diverse group of, of young men to take a stand about their right to, uh, to, to an equal shake in life. But the thing that struck me as unusual, and I don't know if you think it's of a pattern, but the equivocation from political leaders in this country in particular has, has been quite striking on it. The fact that you have fans booing their own team and uh, the kind of usual easy wins that come from saying, oh, no, no, let's just all get behind the England team have, have been absent. That's That's been a little bit strange. Strange, striking, um, shocking, um, shameful, I, I go as far to say. This 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 current government, um, you know, are not, are, not, are not to my taste, uh, you know, fine. I've, it's not the first, but their attitude towards sport um, over the last 15, 16 months and football in particular, which is my sort of, if you like, specialised subject, um, has been, uh, I think, unlike um, any other former government in its cynicism and how they have used football as, because they know that it's, um, you know, you hold a great big mirror up to society. There's, there's all sorts of things you can address and and, and uh, deal with using football as your as your sort of medium. So we've gone from, you know, that they're greedy and they're not all in it together. So about money, when really we should have been talking about, you know, furloughing and, and support for small businesses and and uh, that sort of thing. You know, and then it sort of, you know, it, it, it sort of morphed a number of times, you know, kind of how, how the Premier League shares its money. Um you know what the EFL does and the spending there, non-league football, um, football versus other sports. The government has, has just been playing games with football for months and months and months. You know, at times, um, you know, we have the fan-led review, and it's sort of about football. You know, play, very much playing to um, the red wall uh, constituencies, and you know, look, they're not the first bunch to jump up and down and tell you that they support their local team. That's fine. You know. All, all politicians do that, and they're all equally annoying. But they are, I think, the first bunch of senior politicians to do it so candidly at times and with it utterly shamelessly. You know, they're sort of, and it, you know, I go back to the pointless tussles they've had with Marcus Rashford um, when Rashford's been on the right side of the argument every time. And this this sort of need to sort of other and demonise rich young men at times, you know, when it was convenient to do so for them for news management reasons or for making some other wider point. Um, 
you know, and then they sort of, you know, at times, you know, they've weighed into the cricket debate around, you know, inappropriate tweets. What are they doing? Why are they getting involved in this stuff? They don't need to. They don't need to make these wider points, you know, if they're sort of signaling about wokery or whatever it is or virtue signaling. Just just there's there's plenty of other ways to do that. You know, if you want to sort of show that you're a laissez-faire, you know, liberal um, government, you know, don't, you don't need to get involved in how the ECB disciplines its cricketers. You know, that's that's not for that's not for national governments to do. And just their their initial response to the booing, which to be honest with you, I think we could talk about for an hour. I don't I don't think we really need to though. I think enough has been said on that, the rights and wrongs of that, um, and you know, what what it's really about and what and what people are really up some people are upset about. Um and we're not gonna change anyone's mind either. That's really clear. So whatever we do say strikes me as slightly pointless, which is sad and depressing, but just it, it would, no minds are going to be made up either way. But just on the, you know, to go back to your, your very good question, the initial government response, this is, this is them so, finger in the air, just, just trying to constantly sort of work out what is the cool thing to say, what, 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 will, what, will, what will play well with focus groups was to sort of, you know, come out on the, yeah, it's fine, Boeing's fine. No, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna and then all oh no no actually no um the 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 opinion polling on that one appears to be going the other way. Um so no of course you shouldn't boo. Of course you shouldn't boo. No we got that we got that U turn in what was what was it about it was about day and a half. And it's just it's just all so it's just so crap. Um you know have some spy and show some leadership. Of, of, of course it's wrong to boo your team. Even if you disagree with the stance they're taking, you don't boo your own team. You know, sit there, watch what they're doing, try and maybe understand why they're doing it. It doesn't take long, and then and then get on with cheering them. Um, 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 yeah. It's not offensive to you, and there's no way. And for politicians to to just to misread that that badly, I just it just it just it wound me up more than the boo boys, to be honest. Yeah, well, I mean, the wider point. I suppose um, we we do need to wrap this half up, but you know this is a, a sports industry podcast, and and we do need to to consider things in that context. But I suppose the wider point for a lot of rights holders is going to be a lot a lot of national associations, federations. You're going to come into contact with this kind of discussion, this kind of discourse um, if you take a stand. I think to be fair, the England team have managed themselves with. Uh, with real maturity in in this case and it has shown the value of if you are committing to a, a course of action to following it through but it's it's not the last we'll hear of uh, of sport getting dragged into a culture war unfortunately but um hopefully it's a, a story that more people yeah people will get behind what the england team are doing and, and but, but just on, just on a little final point on that but one of the things that I find most irritating in, in, in what I do, right? So you often hear this, sport and politics don't mix. That is, that is a fairy tale. It's one of the tritest and daftest comments that I ever hear. Yes, in an ideal world, sport and politics wouldn't mix, but they have been inextricably linked for about 5,000 years, if not longer. I, I, I can't quite remember what was going on in those early Olympic Games, but um, yes, politics was absolutely front and centre of those early javelin and wrestling contests and running around the tree and back. You can mark my words. And um, it, the, the, the closeness and the obviousness of the link comes and goes, right? But it's always there. We just so happen to be going for a period where it's inescapable. It's, I mean, I'm actually sort of struggling to think of sort of a, a sporting event, a story where there isn't really a political angle. And, I, and for the last sort of 10, 15 years, they've just been so bloody obvious. And sport is just being used constantly as a vehicle for what politicians are trying to do, sometimes for the best, often not. So this idea that sport and politics don't mix, I mean, it just, that's just a waste of words. I just, I just you know, I, I want to do the Alan Partridge, you know, meme to that one. You know, what? what Yes, great, brilliant. Thank you for that. Well, in the real world, here's actually what's happening, and the the eighteen times today that sport and politics have mixed. Rant over. Yeah, quite well. Anyway, what the politicians are telling us is that Wembley Stadium will be at half capacity for the semi-finals and final second week of July. 
you'll be getting 45,000 people in northwest London. But there's a lot to go through. Until then, we will be covering that over the next few editions of the Sports Pro podcast. Um, we are going to take a break now, though, and we're going to be hearing from TJ Isofano, the head of growth and strategy consulting at Infront X, about the evolution of digital experiences for fans. Obviously, they've been out of stadiums for most of the last 18 months. Um, what are some of the trends that have evolved during that time? How are rights holders going to be able to stand out in the streaming market and, and, and with all the competition that's going on there? Uh, lots to consider from design and purpose uh, to integration of services. That's all coming up just after this. Hello, I'm Matt Rogan. I've spent my career creating and scaling businesses in sports and entertainment. And now I'm talking to smart leaders inside and outside sport to get their ideas on managing change and building towards a better future. You can listen in on the Playbook podcast, a collection of candid, agenda-free conversations full of practical advice your company can work with. Get your new episodes right here on the Sports Pro feed and check out the rest of the series wherever you get your podcasts. TJ Isofano, Head of Growth and Strategy Consulting at Infront X. Welcome to the Sports Pro Podcast. Hey, it's uh, nice to meet you and thank you guys for Sports Pro Media for entertaining us on this podcast and giving me a chance to speak. So thank you there. Well, you're very welcome. Thank you for coming on. And we're going to be talking about digital experiences in sport, digital products that rights holders should be um, looking at uh, to, to help reach their fans and and, uh, and and help them to get more out of the sports that they enjoy. But just to give us a bit of a framing for the conversation, you know, why don't you tell us a little about Infront X to start with? Sure, sure. And, and we've gone through a few rebrands in the last few years, but we, we go by Infront X now. Um, and we're a company underneath Infront Sports and Media, which is one of the largest sports rights companies in, in the world. Um, Infront X is a digital solutions provider um, for some of the biggest brands in sports um, all over the world. Um, so we're a technology first company focused on web and mobile, um, providing solutions to rights holders. Um, and building them with a live events uh, sort of uh, solution. And I'm sure one of the things that will come out over the course of the conversation is that positioning within the Infront group and, and some of the things that, that that lets you do. But let's look at the look at some of the trends within this sector. Um, so it's one that's been changed a fair bit in the last few years. And then some of the things that we had been looking towards in the 2020s have approached a lot quicker because of the pandemic and because of people consuming more stuff digitally, consuming more stuff remotely, um, you know, the need to connect people differently and the need to connect groups differently, I think is, is the biggest thing uh, that, that we've seen in the last year. But, you know, what, what, what are some of the things now that we are going to start seeing mass events happening and they are happening this summer in, uh, in different territories to, to varying degrees. Uh, what are the trends that we're going to be looking out for through the rest of the 21? Well, well sure. And, and we've got a couple of things to look forward to. We've got the Euros happening right now, and we've got the Olympics coming up soon. Um, but you're still not seeing full capacity in stadiums. And so there's still this pressure uh, to deliver a very good at-home experience. So there's there's a number of trends that we're following. But in the short term, I think the impact um, around consumer habits changing with the way they they um, consume video, the way they consume digital, I think that's definitely changed. Um, we're also paying attention to how the gaming space, the fantasy space, gambling space is now kind of infiltrating all digital, um, especially in America here. We're, we're watching as legislation changes. Um, we're waiting to see how this impacts the um, rights holders and broadcasters and how they deliver um, sports content. Um, and then a couple other ones we're watching is um, how rights holders are building online communities to develop fan sentiment fandom. Um, so changing consumer habits, definitely the gaming space has a big impact. Um, and then how online communities fandoms are being developed uh, by rights holders. 
Mm. And how much of that has been affected? Where are you able to measure the effect of that over the last uh, the last 18 months with everything that has happened so differently from what we would have anticipated? I, I think what, what we're really tracking is this kind of attention economy. And I believe that right around 2018, 2019, we reached this peak saturation point. Um, so I think, I think what we're seeing now and what we're telling our customers is uh, fan engagement has become a zero-sum game. Um, if they're not uh, playing around with your mobile app or they're watching the live uh, syndicated broadcast of your sport, they may be out fishing, they may be out playing soccer, they may be out doing other things with their family. So this idea of a zero-sum game uh, is something that we're preaching. Um, and really what that means is if you're not engaging your fans and building that positive fan sentiment, then there are so many other choices um, for entertainment. Now um, it's become um, a huge competition. Um, sports used to compete head to head with other sports. Now it's competing head to head with other streaming services and just generally speaking, other forms of entertainment. And let's talk a bit about that streaming market because that is somewhere where with, with live events being uh, unavailable in particular, sport has kind of gone into that content market more in a, in a way that it's never really done before. And at a time when lots of other viewer behavior has shifted even further towards on demand, we've seen um, the proliferation of, of streaming services, especially in the US, um, Disney Plus kind of on the rampage around the world as well. Uh, it's a very, very competitive marketplace. What do what do rights holders need to be aware of? What what are some of the things, some of the insights that they can draw on uh, to help them compete in that space? Well, so so then the, the the problem that we're watching is this kind of confusion of choice, um, which is a user experience issue. It's how how do I make a choice for the type of streaming content, VOD content that I want to watch for the next hour or two hours. Um, so I think live sports really has a problem here, making sure that their content is findable um, and, and searchable. Um, I think, and I can speak from personal um, situation that it's become very difficult to know when the match it, that I want to watch is on. Um, and it oftentimes can, competes with other things, other forms of entertainment. So this kind of confusion of choice uh, will be something to watch out for. And those are digital problems, uh, problems with your CRM, with your outreach, with your marketing strategy, how you reach your fans. Um, and then there's there's a whole world of fan segmentation that we can talk about. Um, how, do you, how do you get those kind of passive fans to become active fans? Those are all digital problems that we see all the time. On that point about things being difficult to find, I think it was reflected a little bit in, in, in some of the media numbers we saw, again, especially in North America, because there was a, a very considerable seasonal shift in when uh, some games were being played in 2020. And you're actually seeing that start to correct itself a bit in 2021 as um, as you're starting to see events back where you would expect them. But, you know, there were sports that, that did suffer a bit through that. But were there any, were there any things that you tried... Um, that you were working with with your clients that were able to address that problem and, and make it uh, easier to easier to find events, easier to find content, easier for rights holders to 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 stand out among you know the Netflixes and the Disneys and and the other streaming services. Yeah, yeah. I, I, there's probably a couple different things here, um, but one thing that that I would concentrate on is the way we work with our clients is with a continuous innovation strategy, a, a evolution of their products, their digital products over time. So every season, new features, new innovation gets incorporated into the game plan. Um, now there's a certain level of uh, planning and preparedness that needs to happen prior to the live events happening. Um, so we can't introduce too many new features and still um, kind of reduce the risk of having the live event uh, in a di digital format. But, um, you know, what we're seeing right now is the deeper the engagement for fans, um, the better the fan sentiment is. Um, so we, when we when we talk about releasing functionality for for um, events on the weekends, we want fans to be able to go deeper into the sport and spend more time 
looking at um, the way data is visualized, looking at ways to combine video and data and, and rich media in, in meaningful ways to keep them kind of entertained with the sport. Um, so, and we've seen a we've seen a good amount of traction with those immersive digital experiences. What are some of the next steps with that? What are some of the implications and, and the possibilities when it comes to interactivity, when it comes to personalization? What stage of that journey, I guess, are, are we on right now? I think we're kind of in the test and learn or experimentation phase because what we often tell our clients is, let's talk about the key success metrics and KPIs first. What are the business objectives first? And that allows us to help them build the right funding business case around these digital experiences. Um, what we don't want to do is just build digital products for, for no reason, um, because they often they fall flat and they don't achieve what, what's expected. Um, but if we talk to them about success metrics, whether it's reach, whether it's conversion or monetization, um, really understanding that can help us craft the right digital experiences moving forward. You're listening to the Sports Pro Podcast. Okay, so let's take a step back from there before we start looking at, at some specific things that we might start to see emerging or be really influential in, in the next few years. Are there different profiles of rights holder that you identify in terms of what should be interesting them uh, in the digital space? So, you know, we I'm, in the next few minutes, we might be talking about things that are very top level features maybe that could have a, a profound effect to say how someone watches Euro 2020, which we were just talking about, but are not the core experience that another rights holder needs to be making sure that they're delivering. So, so we do have an idea around how to tier different leagues, organizations, and teams. Um, mainly our, our, our focus is on kind of the top tier, those big leagues like NASCAR, PGA Tour, um, and, and others. So we're thinking big usually, but there's plenty to do in those tier two and tier th three leagues. Mm. Their, their problems are actually fundamentally different. Um, when you're talking to minor league baseball, for instance, they're not maybe as concerned with the linear TV and broadcast experience. <laughs> they're more they're more engineered around the family experience and, and how a family of four comes in and enjoys the sport, um, how much time they spend, um, what the process is for getting in and out of the venue, um, how to maximize that kind of memory for them. Um, so yeah, we're, we're, we have different ways of, of thinking about those tiers. Let's talk about that live venue experience for, for a sec, because we've, we've, you know, looked on, uh, we've looked a fair bit at the content side already, but how is that going to have changed as we see fans start to return, particularly as some of the things that people were talking about, um, whether it's contactless payments, whether it's integration of different kinds of experiences, in-seat ordering, all that type of stuff um, that, that's been, been discussed for maybe about a decade or more um, as being a possibility. How much is that now going to become a bit more of a baseline expectation, even when you're talking about a minor league baseball or a competition at that, at that level? So there's a couple different stages or evolutions that we're seeing happening. Um, rights holders and even venue holder venue owners we're focused just on the live event and supporting the live event. And, and there's plenty of evidence that that fan engagement can happen kind of as a second screen uh, in the context uh, of a live event. Um, we've done plenty of work for Verizon with the Super Bowl around their their Super Stadium app um, with multicams and showing different replay capabilities and AR VR capabilities um, within the live event itself. Um, but now the conversation has kind of expanded to, uh, to take a little bit more holistic view, both pregame, shoulder content, parking, um, turnstile, and, and creating a frictionless experience for people getting into the venue. And then post-event, there's really this notion of a haloing effect. How do we create lasting memories? How do we give them the opportunity to continue thinking about the live event that they just experienced? and continue that, that fan journey 
whether it's buying merchandise of the player that hit the home run um, or, or some sort of captured memory um, that they can then, rights holders can think about as, as an opportunity to, to continue to engage fans um, even long after the live event is, is done. Um, and all the while, um, what they're really doing is they're, they're adding data to the profile of the person that, that experienced the event. Uh, the more data they have, the more personalized the, the future experiences can be. And how deep can that integration go? Is that something that you can talk about working into participation, working into other experiences of the sport? So if you're a rights holder that perhaps uh, has a responsibility, not just for the live event, but for, you know, in a way a, a team might not have, but if you're a federation or, or a rights holder on, on that level, you might have yeah, a... yeah we, we have given some thought around that. And I think conversations with the IOC have, have kind of um, have brought this to the forefront is what what role does the, the global governing body take in this kind of education um, and experience role? I, I think I think that's an interesting notion. I think I see that those those big uh, governing bodies as um, a way to encourage development of the sport and also development of fans to understand the sports rules and, and everything that that organization can offer around just educating fans. I do think they they take a back seat, especially like FIFA and IOC, they take a little bit of a back seat to the local organizing committees and I guess the people on the ground with with engaging fans directly. Um, but you know they also have to think about their sponsors and their broadcasters and what they can do to enable them um, as these big live events kind of go forward. Um, so I'm really interested to see how the Olympics handles this, uh, given the fact that they've delayed an entire year and we're going to see minimal fans in, in the stadiums. Uh, so things will be very quiet um, during the competitions, which could be very interesting to see. Something that we've talked about a couple of times is uh, is the experience. And obviously, as you were describing there, the desire to keep longer periods of contact with fans, have fans coming back to uh, to, to learn more about their sport or watch more of it or order products or, or what have you. What kind of a role does design play in that? How do you incorporate usability of a product? You know, how, how significant is the usability of a product to delivering some of those objectives? Yeah, I, I, and I think the, the purpose of whatever experience that you're designing needs to be established well in advance prior to the design phase. Um, we always point back to those key objectives and, and, and KPIs to understand really what, what we're trying to achieve. Um, some of the work that we're, we're doing um, for FIFA around the utility of the in-venue experience, getting people, for instance, in a wayfinding scenario from point A to point B has to be as simple and easy to use as humanly possible. So. The, the, the idea of fan engagement is probably less important than the utility of the function you're, you're developing. So um, I would be really careful mixing the utility of your app with the entertainment and gaming aspects of your app. Um, you don't want frustrated people. And you also want, especially in venue applications, you want them to be a companion to the live event. You don't want it to be a distraction from the live event. Um, and we've been toying with this idea of how the scoreboard has often been an aid to the live event. The mobile app as a second screen should also kind of behave in the same way. And, and I suppose a step on from that, something that we are increasingly talking about when it comes to, to media consumption, but which is always a part of the live event, is integrating different services. So... If um, if we're talking about a live event, it might be ordering food and beverage. Um, it might be your app functioning as your ticket. It might be uh, wayfinding, which which you mentioned just there. But increasingly, we're, we're hearing people talk about their ambitions when it comes to watching content as well, watching live sport. Can you bring up in-game data? Can you bring up opportunities to buy merchandise? Can you bring up opportunities to, to call in a food delivery 
service as well, all within an app potentially, or you know, offering calls to action within the app at, at, at the very least. How do you bring those things together? How do you create a comprehensive experience that doesn't get cluttered, that doesn't get confusing, that doesn't that that still serves a, a meaningful purpose and is adding value that you don't get by just saying, "Well, I'll just you know get my digital wallet out instead of doing something within." Uh, within this app that's trying to do everything for me. So there's definitely a balancing act that needs to happen. Um, and I think one big concern is that I have is, is cognitive overload. Um, and if, for anyone listening that has children at home and you, and you watch them have passive video on the TV, an iPad perhaps with a friend calling on Zoom, and then their handheld is playing a, a video game, all three sources of, of kind of entertainment and distraction um, simultaneously happening. Well, the, the sports fan isn't, you know, 12 years old. Typically, it's kind of in that 30 to 50 range, or maybe even trending older. Um, that cognitive overload problem, I think, is going to be a real, real issue moving forward. So I wouldn't, I think the balancing act is let's not be too distracting to the primary source of entertainment. Let's, let's, emphasize it or enhance it along the way. Um, so again, it goes back to planning and product development. You know, I, I think thinking about these problems ahead of time before investigating um, is a big deal. And then, you know, there's always opportunities to, to build POCs and do focus groups and test what this experience actually kind of executes as. Um, and, and then learning from those, those tests and in that research to build provocative um, changes or, or continue on the path that you thought you were going on. But yeah, that's that's kind of how I would think about it. But I, I am personally worried that we're over, overwhelming the viewer, um, which I think is not doing a service to the actual live event. Yeah, so it's, it's about understanding where a service is useful, um, but where perhaps observing behavior, I guess, and working out where that's comfortable for somebody uh, to, to bring into their experience and, and, and where it just becomes awkward. And you also have to think that the broadcasters are testing this too. When they feel like there's downtime soccer matches, there might be a player down for an injury. You know, they may pop another video window in and show a small ad, or they might add some commentary or some overlay. Um, so they're already kind of getting into that game as well. Um, so just think about what that's like. You have one video source, a second video source, and now perhaps something in your hand that may also be um, connected to the, the live uh, event itself. Um, so, I, so that balancing act is all about planning and product development. You talked about us being in a, a bit of a test and learn period at the moment, particularly through 2021. I was just interested when it comes to Infront X, the position that you have within the Infront Sports and Media Group, what does that allow you to do in terms of having access to different rights holders, having access to, to data, having access to you know live test cases, I guess, that give you some insight into how sports fandom is, is evolving? Sure, yeah, and I think the European market is much different than the American market. Um, typically in the American market, most big leagues are, are, have some sort of relationship directly with broadcasters. They also have their own direct to consumer strategies. So, um, we're, we're very focused on being a support mechanism, an outsource partner and, and, and supplier to make sure that those leagues are enabled against these problems. I'm curious to see some of the changes that we made during the COVID period Will they last beyond COVID when, when people are in stands? I think one really tangible example is when we saw the NBA in the bubble and we saw those fans and digital screens surrounding the stadium. Will we continue on that idea of tuning in to a screen even when the NBA is, is fully loaded with fans in the stands? My hunch was that we would still see some aspect of that blended in with, with the real fans. This kind of blending of the virtual world and the physical world, I think, could be a very interesting place to go. Um, because I think what we all realize is those are sponsorable assets. Those are ways for Microsoft to get their brand kind of exposed in a new way. Um, and, and our rights holders and leagues are all always looking for new ways 
to generate revenue. So I, I would think that some of these COVID experiences would live on past COVID and we wouldn't just kind of snap back to 2019 um, when the world was somewhat normal. Uh, but yeah, I, we're, we're watching to see how things change and how they go back to normal and how they don't. Um, but I do think consumer habits have certainly changed. So rights holders will be dealing with that indefinitely. And beyond that, what are what are some of the medium term trends going into the rest of the 2020s that you're keeping an eye on? And, and what are the markers? What are the uh, what are the, the things that you're looking out for that are going to give you an indication uh, of how likely those trends are to, to eventuate? Yeah, yeah, I think I think the consumption of short form content will be interesting clips, highlights, um, and even versions of matches that are in a shorter, condensed VOD form. Um, that's, that's an area I think we're, we're paying um, a bit of attention to, and that's an area that we can support. As the rights holders in the leagues build these live events, what, what I'm sensing is they need to maximize the value of that media, and one way to maximize it is to cut it up into pieces and, and give uh, fans new experiences that incorporate shorter form um, video content. So that that I think is something that's going to take hold. Um, you know, there's already evidence that that younger generations want to consume shorter pieces of media, um, and so that fits well with adopting that new kind of audience perspective. The other the other trend I think is going to be really interesting is going to be gambling. I think in the UK we they've learned quite a bit around this in the last decade. Um, and America is gonna probably learn it all again. <laughs> uh, as states start to legalize gambling, I think um, casual gaming fantasy is pushing fans to wanna gamble um, and bet beyond just outcomes too and live betting scenarios. Um, so I think it will be interesting to see how lessons that have already been learned in, in Europe are going to be adapted to America. Yeah, I'm anxious to see that. TJ, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it, Owen. Um, it's always a pleasure to talk. Infront X thanks you uh, and Sports Pro Media, and we'll catch up again. Get the very best of Sports Pro sent straight to your inbox. Head to sportspromedia.com and sign up for the Sports Pro Daily. You'll get a roundup of all the biggest stories, features and opinion from our team every single morning. You'll find that all and much more at sportspromedia.com. Sports Pro, connecting and inspiring the business world of sport. Okay, that will do it for another Sports Pro podcast. Thanks again to TJ Isofano for his time just there. Thanks to you, Matt Slater. No problem. Thank you to you for having me. Always good to have you on. Looking forward to the rest of the tournament? Yeah, very much so. Any any predictions? Any that have changed in the opening days? No, I'm not. I'm not going to do that. No, 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 no. I mean, look. I, if you're if you're fishing for an England prediction, we're, we're doing fine. That's as far as I'm going. I'd like us to do fine for as long as we can. Yeah. You know, I thought Italy were good. I'm looking forward to seeing France. Yeah, I don't. You know, the, 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 I th- hopefully I've given something away of where I think the tournament's really going to go. But yes, I'm pleased that we're in the tournament. We've contributed. We look like. We have a plan and, um, and yeah, that's it. Well, we're, we're all going to enjoy seeing what happens and, and hopefully uh, everyone will get something out of the competition after everything we've been through over the last, uh, last long while. But, uh, yeah, thanks again, Matt. Always good to have you on. Thanks to all of you for listening and we will speak to you again very soon. Bye-bye. The Sports Pro Podcast is published by Sports Pro Media. The producer is Ed Dixon. 